So let's move on to our next slide. Now, you're, this is Fiveable, and you, you can watch all kinds of updates on Fiveable on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. So be sure you, just, you go ahead and subscribe to these so you can stay in the know at Think Fiveable. Tonight, we're going to deal with Europeans asserting power through mercantilism. We're talking government. This actually mix of economics, too. Maritime exchange networks, continuity and change. Um, this is economic. We're also going to see cultural changes of the slave trade, which is a cultural background. The Atlantic slave trade trading system, moving labor, which is social and syncretic religions. This is cultural, especially belief systems. So get ready. Let's jump in. All right. So this is where the chat box comes in. So I want you to take a look at this picture here and tell me in the chat box, what do you see in this picture? So don't be shy. Just jump on in. Tell me things that you see. You see a fight. Absolutely. Shipwreck could be. Yeah, we got a shipwrecking. What else do you see? Pong Champ, uh-huh. Latin sales, yes, you got a battle. Does anybody notice the flags? Well, you have one up there. Close. We've got a Portugal. No, not quite the not quite Christopher Columbus yet. We have an Ottoman Empire ship close to Spain, Portugal. We have a Portuguese ship and an Ottoman Empire ship fighting out here. So this is going to be a major battle. So no, I don't. Uh, hopefully the Pinto was not fighting. Um, but we're not quite the Middle Passage yet. This is actually a major battle. It's a preview of what's coming. So thanks for the great participation. We're going to keep on rolling. So when you want to understand competing maritime empires, one of the big things you have to learn about is mercantilism. Mercantilism is an economic theory. It just simply says that a country is serving itself best when it exports more than it imports. Now, when you export more than you import, you're making profits often in bullion. So it's really trade balance. You want to make sure you're exporting more and importing less so that back then mercantilist wealth was in gold and silver. These are universally accepted currencies. So whoever, whenever you're trading, if you're exporting substantially more than you're importing, that means you're gathering more silver and gold and whoever has the most gold and silver in mercantilism wins. So governments also encourage these profit balances by engaging in protectionism, which actually is something that's not new. We're actually seeing this right now happen between the United States and, Ch and the People's Republic of China. But let's dive into an example of protectionism. One way that governments did this is they forced their colonies to only buy from the mother country. In other words, if you were Spain and there were Spanish colonies, you could only buy from Spain, which gave them the ability to buy your raw goods for less and charge more for your manufactured goods. So the mother country, Spain, and it could also be Portugal, Ottoman Empire, British, French, Dutch, you name the country, they're going to come out. The mother country is going to come out ahead. So it's the colonies. I like to say in some ways, it's kind of like a wash rag full of water. You just wring them dry, literally. So more gold and silver is good unless it's too much. Yes, you got to watch out for when that happens with Spain, but we're going to tie that in. Part of the difficulty with that, and I'm glad you brought it up, is because 
they mined too much silver and flooded the market. So let's keep moving on. Now you're going to see maritime empires. This is a European caravel ship. Um, you can see the flag on the back and the caravels had great advantages. One, they were very maneuverable. Two, you could load them full of cannon and fire at good abilities. Three, they had latin sails, which meant they moved much more quickly. Four, compared to conventional older battleships, these were smaller, more maneuverable in battle. And this is going to play a big role in the future that's coming up. So pay attention to the maritime empires, the European caravel, especially the Portuguese. So let's look at some key terms that we're going to need to know so we can move forward. First is maritime. Maritime just means it's sea-based. So if you're talking a maritime empire, it's a sea-based empire. Um, a second point is monopoly. This is not the game, even though it's fun to play. A monopoly is a grant providing exclusive trade to a company or government. So it says that company or that government can have trade. Everybody else, sorry, you're out. You don't have that. So point three is capital. Capital is simply wealth, gold, silver, things you can invest that can be used to create more wealth. They can also be other things. They can be tools. They can be, they can be anything you can use to create wealth. And then four, joint stock companies. Joint stock companies are investors that buy shares in the hope of making money and reducing the risk while they're doing that. Instead of having to venture all the risk, they can buy part or shares of that risk. With the risk, you can lose money, but you can also make money. All right. Maritime empires, by the way, are sea-based empires. In other words, what we're going to see with the Portuguese is that they're going to move about their empire over the sea and you'll have land-based areas and they'll connect by using the sea to get to them. So maritime empires also focus on trade and as opposed to like the Silk Road trade. That Silk Road would be land-based empires. This is maritime or sea-based. Now, it's time for viewer input, which I know has been great. And yes, Indian Ocean trade, that would be maritime. So let's look at mercantilism. So viewer input. Now, you, what you want to do is look at the question, and then you're going to put down A, B, C, or D. So what is not a characteristic of mercantilism? Is it A, accumulating gold and silver bullion through trade surpluses? Is it B, promoting exports to other countries to build cash and bullion reserves? C, forcing colonies of the mother country to purchase manufactured items from only the mother country? Or is it D, promoting free trade through regional trade alliances? All right, let's let the answers come in. I see D, D, D. Let's see if we have some other people coming in. Okay, possible C. So what is not a characteristic of mercantilism? And the vast majority of you are absolutely correct. It's D. That's not part of mercantilism because it wasn't about free trade through regional trade alliances with other countries. It was about you being able as a country to control as much of trade as possible. That's how you export more, import less, and gather as much wealth in silver and gold as you can. So C could be protectionism, which yes, is associated with mercantilism. B, promoting exports to other countries to build cash and bullion reserves, classic mercantilism. A, accumulating gold, silver bullion through trade surpluses, classic mer mercantilism. 
D is more European Union, um, Mercosur, um, Asian Pacific Free Trade Agreement. So this is not mercantilism. This is a very different world. So let's keep moving on. And of course, you can see D is the correct answer. So good job. Doug. I see a lot of people with D's on there. So well done. And also some very good explanations. All right, let's jump into Europeans asserting their power through mercantilism. So we know that mercantilism is an economic system that focuses on how much gold and silver a country builds through trade to achieve wealth and power. Now, countries in Western Europe aimed to gain this gold and silver through trade, but it had the favor of the mother country above all else. Now, the Portuguese are going to launch off at this first. Then it'll be the Spanish. Then you're going to see the British, the Dutch, the French. Don't forget about the Ottomans, who have been here for quite a while. So those are examples of mother countries. Now, investors are also encouraged to go into this process by purchasing shares in joint stock companies. These companies would be the ones that the government of the mother country would get the authority to go out and trade with, to do the trade with other areas. So, like I said, England, France, Spain, Portugal, and the Dutch were key European maritime powers. The Ottoman Empire was a key West Asian maritime power and the Ottomans and the Portuguese would fight it out repeatedly for control over Indian Ocean trade ports. Spoiler alert, Portugal's going to win in the end on this one. So let's go to a map and take a look at this. You're going to see some of the major battles occurring near Muscat, near the Persian Gulf. You're going to see this down in the Gulf of, of Aden. On the south end of the Arabian Peninsula, you're going to see areas all throughout India, um, the Spice Islands, um, Mahajapit, the um, and also what prior to that was Srivijaya empires. You're going to see battles occurring between the Ottomans that had been trading in these areas and the Portuguese who are aggressively asserting control. And what the Portuguese are doing is east coast of Africa all through India, parts of Asia, they are establishing ports. So they're moving throughout East Africa, Middle East, Asia. They're establishing themselves very powerfully and they're using gunpowder weaponry to provide that kind of firepower to back them up. Now, note the Ottomans have this too, but the Portuguese are on the uprise. So note from 1536 to 1580, you're going to see a lot of competition between Ottomans and the Portuguese. But like I said in the spoiler, the Portuguese are going to come out on top. Yes, this is a golden era for the Portuguese. So let's keep moving. And now... Do we have a key exception to this rule? We could. Let's see, how many of you have heard of the Moroccan Songhai conflict? Let's see how many people pop in there. Now, I know a couple people who are here know about this already, but I don't expect most people to. That's all right. We're going to lay it out for you. Okay. I'm glad you've heard of it. Here it is. Now, What's going to happen is that Morocco, in its desire to revive the gold and salt trade that used to be trans-Saharan trade, is going to instruct Moroccan forces under Judar Pasha to attack the Songhai Empire in West Africa. And in green on this map, you can see what is the Songhai Empire at its height. You remember when we talked about um, West African empires. This is, we're going back to this. So even though they were outnumbered, Moroccan forces under Pasha defeat the Songhai king, Askia Ishak II. Now, 
Jiddar Pasha takes this as great. It's a Moroccan victory. We walk into the Songhai areas. We take control of their gold and salt deposits, and we start trading. However, when Pasha, when Jiddar, Jiddar Pasha dies, this control is going to fall apart. Morocco will not be able to continue controlling this. So Songhai territory is going to fall to a mixture of different warlords, the Portuguese, the Spanish. So Morocco is not going to have control over this long after Jidar Pasha's death. And eventually, this isn't a key exception, though the Europeans win again. In this case, it's the Portuguese and the Spanish come out on top, ultimately. So let's keep moving on, but do know about the Moroccan Songhai conflict. Now, maritime exchange networks. Let's deal with some of the continuity and change. Remember, continuity is change that occurs over time. Excuse me, let me start again. Continuity means staying the same, continuing over time. Okay? Now, if you have change, that means over time you're seeing things that change. So, what we're going to do is take a look at continuity, things that stay the same over time in maritime exchange networks, especially those in the Atlantic, Indian Ocean areas. So a continuity that we see is many Indian Ocean merchants, they're paying fees to trade. So if you want to pass through the Strait of Malacca, where you have the island of Sumatra, which is Indonesia today, and you have this, you have um, the Ithamus that goes down, that is Thailand, Malaysia, and now Singapore. People used to control that area. It's highly policed, and you had to pay to move through the Straits of Malacca so you could access other East Asian cities and ports and empires. If you did not, this could put you at risk to having your cargo seized. You could be sunk. So the Strait of Malacca is a great example of this type of sea lanes and also ports in Asia. You had to pay to use them. So this is one way that Indian Ocean merchants made money in doing that. So let's look at the change that occurs in this period. Portuguese forces. They're going to be building, using those European caravel ships, superior fighting forces. And they're going to sail around. Remember, they have guns, gunpowder weaponry. And most of the people they're running into, except for the Ottomans and Mamluks and a couple other situations, they're not initially having these type of weaponry. So... Think of these European caravels as firepower that's mobile that moves all around the ocean. So they will pull up to key trade posts. They will either threaten or they'll just open fire on them. And then they'll say, surrender or we'll destroy you. And most trading posts, they don't want to give up their ability to trade. So they fall under Portuguese control. So we see a lot of when we looked at Indian Ocean trade, Eastern Africa, like um, the Swahili people, Mombasa, city of Mombasa, Mogadishu, we're going to see Kilwa, Sofala, are going to fall under Portuguese control. Now, this is not going to go completely unopposed, especially for those posts in Africa and also ones in Asia like Goa that the Portuguese will have. You're going to see Guajarati when this is, and this is part of India and allied forces with them defe defeated by the Portuguese at the battle of Diu. Diu is in the Arabian Sea. So if you go just west of India, that's the Arabian Sea. You'll see Iran to the top. So at the battle of Diu, the Portuguese are going to win decisively. And this is going to give them a major upper hand over the Guajarati, 
over the Venetians that were supporting them, the Mamluks from Egypt. All of these groups were going to come out losing. Portugal had better ships, better tactics, better firepower, and money to back it up. So these Indian Ocean routes shift to the Portuguese, and new routes now start coming open in the Americas when, when Christopher Columbus goes over to the America and discovers the Americas, the Portuguese are right behind the Spanish in doing this as well. So not only we're going to have Indian Ocean trade, but we're going to now have transatlantic trade from Africa and Europe to North and South America. So a whole new arena of trade is coming open. Here's a picture of the Battle Dieu in 1509. So this battle was won by the Portuguese in the Arabian Sea against the Guajaratis, the Mamluks of Egypt, the Zamorin of Calicut. With Venetian support, they lost to the Portuguese. The Portuguese take control of trade in the Indian Ocean and East Asia, and they become the predominant power in this area. So let's take a look at this slide for a moment. In the chat box, tell me what you see. So when you're looking at the slide with the Battle of Diu, what do you see? Yes, the Portuguese can be in some ways like the Mongols of the sea. At that time, they definitely had the upper hand. What else do people see? Mm hmm All right, let's go ahead and continue. I'm not sure if they're running the sea, the battle, but it's a huge array of ships fighting. So good points, good questions. All right, now let's shift over to maritime exchange networks. Continuity and change, we're gonna keep on. We hadn't finished. So the discovery of silver in Spanish colonies um, in Mexico and what is today Bolivia. Now the book's gonna tell you Peru, which is actually correct back then because it was the vice royalty of Peru and Mexico. But if you look at current borders today, probably one of the most rich silver mines in the world is in Potosi. This is in Bolivia. Do not go up to a Bolivian and tell them, oh, it's in Peru today. Mm -mm. They will get very offended. They are quite proud of their, of their silver. This is going to fuel Native American worker exploitation. So Europeans are going to go, well, I don't want to go down these mines with mercury, which there are no safe levels of mercury, okay? They don't want to go down there. They don't want to risk shafts collapsing on them. So they said, oh, Native Americans will send them down there. So as time moves on, however, Native Americans die predominantly from disease, but also from overworking. And there's mass, massive labor supply. Ne demand needs to be filled with a supply. So the Portuguese start at West Africa and the Spanish will not be far behind them. And they're going to start the practice of purchasing African individuals, turning them into slaves and taking them across the Atlantic through the Middle Passage to North America and South America. So polygyny, polygyny, excuse me, also it was adopted to assist women in these African societies where you saw enslaved individuals being taken from because you got a major problem. Most enslaved people that were brought over were men. So they kept, they went to certain societies and they continued to deplete the, the number of men there to the point where women were realizing after these slave raids that the number of men were going way down, but their population was not changing that much. So you're going to see polygyny. In other words, you're going to have men with multiple wives in order to make up for this deficiency. Later on, 
Did they take children as slaves very often? Um, usually they wouldn't. They wanted very hardy individuals because the trip is very difficult. So yes, polygyny is women with multiple husbands. Excuse me, is a husband is, excuse me, let me go over that again. Polygyny is women with one husband. So we're trying to solve a problem because we have too many women, too few men, because most of the enslaved individuals are going, are being enslaved. So this is where we're getting them. This is where we're getting the difficulty. So some of the slave raids were especially done by, for example, the Dahomey and the Oyo peoples, just to name a few. So Africans were heavily involved in the slave trade. They were the were slave raiding parties and they profited quite a bit from this. So when you really look at this, you have to go, who's profiting, who are the victims in this? Also, you're going to see areas um, with like the Congo, like which is present day Angola and Cameroon. Large numbers of people are going to come from there. Also, Senegal on the West African coast. So let's continue. All right. Now we're going to go to cultural changes from the Atlantic slave trade. Can you see a pattern here where we're hitting economic, social, e cultural? There's a reason for this, because you find this in the AP framework, whether you use inspect, whether it was the old spice, whether it was spices, whether it's pieces, this is that framework we need to work within to do well. So one of the cultural changes we're going to see here is that part of the triangular trade is what we think of at first, but really it's not just the, it, the, the triangular trade. It also includes the Indian Ocean. So really this is a bow tie and I'll show you on a map in a moment. So you've got goods moving from the Indian Ocean all the way across the Atlantic. So understand that the Colombian exchange is an exchange of of people, culture, diseases, food, crops, plants, animals. It is not a trade system. Triangular trade is this trade system. It Colombian exchange is a exchange. Okay. I don't know about you, but I don't know of anybody selling smallpox or measles, mumps, rubella, things like that. So let's enter into this. Now, Portugal is going to be the first Europeans to traffic slaves from West Africa. Um, you'll see Spain join them afterward. So, yes. So we're going to have slave raids by the Dahomey and the Oyo, aided by European firearms. European guns gave them an incredible advantage because other societies that they raided did not have firearms. They really couldn't resist. So, and like I mentioned, polygyny, too many women, too few men. So let's take a look at the image over here. This is a bronze plaque from Benin, which is also another area. If you see where, and I'll show you on a map soon, where West Coast Africa turns and it looks like it's, it's, it's facing southward. You'll see Ghana, Benin, and Nigeria there. So this is a picture of a Portuguese soldier armed with a musket and accompanied by a dog. So you can see on the lower end, and this is actually a Benin artist doing this. So let's take a look at the bow tie. There is a greater exchange that is going on here. So if we're dealing with the exchange that's moving across the Atlantic Ocean, that would be triangular trade. However, it is not limited there by any means. We have goods that are moving from East Asia, Indian Ocean, all the way across over into the Atlantic. 
And then with some time, when the Spanish start to grow, we're going to see trade from with the silver from Potosi to Acapulco. Acapulco, they'll load it on to Spanish ships, which will go to Spanish-controlled Philippines and will be a location to trade with the Spice Islands, the Chinese. But that's going to come a little bit later on. Right now, we focus probably more on the Portuguese at this moment. However, in this map, you're going to see the British, the French, the Dutch, Portuguese, Spanish. You'll see the different trade routes, the arrows, and the goods that are moving back and forth in these areas. So trade is much more complicated in this area. So if you're doing Atlantic area, triangular trade, that's fine. But if you want to talk worldwide, include the Indian Ocean as well, which was absolutely critical, talk about the bow tie. This is, this is the greater exchange occurring worldwide. All right, the Atlantic trading system. So we're moving labor, in other words, people. We're selling people's commodities. So we're seeing a demand for slaves, and this begins the infamous middle passage of the slave trade from Africa across the Atlantic Ocean to North and South America. You'll see areas like Senegal, Sierra Leone, West African slave trade regions, Congo, Angola, all these areas are going to be exporting not only enslaved individuals to Europe, but the North America and South America. Now, very important, this did not begin slavery. Slavery has, has existed for thousands of years, and it existed before the West, before the Portuguese and the Spanish and other Europeans would come. However, the scale of slavery is unprecedented in the Atlantic system. So this middle passage. So you can see on this map some of the main, you know, numbers of people and where they moved. So it is time for some viewer input. Now, when we go to answer these questions, please do put down the number of the question you're answering. Otherwise, I'm just getting ans answers and we don't know what they're going to. So please put the number. So you can answer in the chat box. So question one, from what areas did the most enslaved individuals come from? So let's go ahead and get some answers. Uh-huh. I'm seeing one, one. Excellent. You all are on, you're on, oh, you're on fire today. Yes, the slave coast or West Africa. So let's go ahead to two. What areas received the most enslaved people and why? So this is number two. So let's go to two. What areas received the most enslaved people and why? So go ahead and put down two, put down those areas, and then tell me real quick why. So we're looking at what areas received the most enslaved people. In other words, coming to them. Yes, so we're definitely seeing Central America and the Caribbean. Um, 4.5 million moving through the West Indies. Now, Spain is going to have the need, but we want to make sure we distinguish that we're dealing with Spanish colonies because the vast majority are not going to go to Europe. So, yes, Brazil, West Indies, 5 million alone to Brazil. You'll see areas like Rio de Janeiro. Also, South America for coffee and mining. Absolutely. So, you're looking for areas that had the sugar plantations. You're looking for areas for mining. You're looking for areas for cotton, sugar, rice, labor intensive activities. All right, and let's answer number three. What areas received the least number of enslaved people and why? So it's number three. Okay, true, I mean, Africa, but they already had enslaved individuals. 
So we want to focus on what areas are they journeying to? Europe and Northeast United States, true. Those are 0.5 and 0.3 million. North America, above Spanish colonies. Mm -hmm. So when you put America, be sure you put, is it North or South America? Um, you'll also see smaller numbers into Central America. There you go. You got it. So it depends. Look for the labor intensive industries. Also in North America, once you get above Virginia, Maryland, these are predominantly areas that are settler based, that are not plantation economies because the weather does not make it possible for them to work most of the year. So let's keep going. Now we're moving over to syncretic belief systems, religions mixed. So now, good question. Did the slave trade end in 1860 because of the US ending slavery? Well, we really want to move to Britain, which in the early 1800s is going to ban the importation, is going to ban the importation of slaves, but will not than slavery, okay? 1860 just deals with the US. Other areas have different timelines. Brazil will continue permitting slavery longer. So let's move over to syncretic belief systems. This is where religions mix. So West African enslaved individuals came over to the Americas with strong belief systems, all right? They already had strong religious traditions. However, Europeans that brought them over there and enslaved them forced Christianity upon them. They did it first to Native Americans, then they would continue to do that with Africans brought over. So the result of these different religious traditions coming together is syncretic beliefs traditions. So let's find out what on earth is syncretic belief systems. First, let's start with syncretism or syncretic. This is the combining of religious beliefs and practices from different regions. All right. So for instance, the picture that you see there is a picture that comes from the, from the syncretic religion Santeria. Now, Centuria refers to the Afro-Cuban practice of Lukumi or Regla de Ocha. It's a religious system originating with the African Yoruba people. Now, this picture is one of the Ochomari. It means God of the Rainbow. And the link between this deity is considered the link between heaven and earth and the Centuria religion. So if you want to find Centuria and other and understand where these religions are existing today. We're going to get into that, but this is just something to get you started and going. And yes, you, you're already ahead of me. So now understand that when Christianity, Native American traditions and African belief systems come together, you find syncretic religions. In other words, it's almost like a buffet system where you're picking this, choosing that, but it's not quite that simple. Many times when Af in African enslaved individuals or Native Americans were forced under European colonist labor, Europeans forced them to follow Christian practices. So you would find African so that were enslaved and they were not willing to give up their traditions. So you would find a lot of times in what was predominantly Roman Catholic churches is that they would take statues or pictures of saints and secretly replace them with deities from their religion in Africa. So this is why you know, if you ever walk into a church in South America or Brazil and in certain areas, you might see someone giving a tremendous amount of devotion, offerings, food, 
flowers, um, doing all kinds of bowing and even what look like elaborate moves and dancing in front of a saint or in front of a statue of, you know, of a saint. This is because they've imposed Christianity upon them and they're secretly worshiping a deity, but not a Christian one. So you're going to see these mixings of traditions, but so Christianity and African religions are going to influence. So this religious blending is syncretic religions. So let me give you some main examples. Vodun. This is also known to a lot of people as voodoo. It means spirit. It originates in Africa in Dahomey, Congo, which is Angola, and the Yoruba peoples who became slaves and they went to Haiti. So this is a Christian African faith mixture. Then Santeria, which means way of the saints. It's an African faith transported to Cuba and other locations in the Caribbean and North America as well. So this is a Christian African faith mixture. If you go to Cuba, if you go to island areas around there, you'll see variants of it like Obede. Um, if you go to Miami or parts of North America, you will see Santeria practiced. Also, here's an example of a Native American Christian faith mixture, which was the cult of the Virgin of Guadalupe and of Guadalupe. And this would go beyond devotion to a cult that blended in Native American practices. So all of these are competing belief systems. And what's happening is religions mixed together. They become syncretic religions or belief systems. All right. If it is a Christian African religion, great question, but they don't have Christian beliefs. Where does that part come from? They do have Christian beliefs. So you're going to see in some of these religions like Santeria, they're actually worshiping. They believe in one God. So Christianity is mixing over. And if you see the candles that are used in some of these syncretic religions, they have Roman Catholic Christian saints on them. And the names are exactly that way. So it's a blending of both. They brought in, they also understand that they came over, they found components of Christianity that they found appealing. So they brought it into their religion. So these became, they left behind the African religion in its pure form, and now they blend religions together. Plus, you needed Christianity to protect yourself because if you don't incorporate that, the people that enslaved you are going to find out what you're doing and they will be most displeased. And that could turn into very bad things for you. So Christian beliefs were eventually became part of the religion. At first, they were there to protect the deities. Then you're going to see a mixing because after several generations, people forget about who comes from what and where. They just go, well, all my life, I've done this. So let's keep moving. Good question. Now, also another one in Brazil, you're going to see candomblé, candomblé which means dance to honor the gods. It's a combination of African beliefs and Christianity in Brazil. This is a Christian African faith mixture. So in this particular map, red areas will be Umbanda or Candombe. You're going to see um, Hinduism in blue, and then you'll see indigenous religions in yellow. This is not to say that Christianity is not widespread there. We're just focusing here on Brazilian belief systems other than Christianity. So now it is time for viewer participation. We're going to step into a short answer question in SAQ. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at this. I'll go ahead and read it while you read it as well. 
the coercion and resistance, acculturation and appropriation that typified the Caribbean experience are the most evident in the creolization of African-based religious beliefs and practices in the slave societies of the new world. African religions merged in a dynamic process with European Christian and Amerindian beliefs to shape syncretic theologies that provide alternative ways for looking at the world, quote, in a certain kind of way. So let's look at a few words here to help us out. Um, acculturation means when your culture assimilates or, or becomes, becomes the lesser culture or may even disappear to the more dominant one. You also see creolization. Creolization is where you see that mixture of Christian Amerindian or Native American and African belief systems coming together. And after a few generations, people forget who came from what. They just know this is how we've practiced this religion. So they're going to continue that. All right. So hopefully, let's stop for a moment. Are there any other words in that quote that people are wondering about? Because we dealt with creolization. We've gone ahead and explained a per, acculturation. Are there any other words? And I'll look in the chat box. Coercion, yes, that is by force. In other words, or by threat. In other words, you will adopt this religion or else very painful and awful things will happen to you. Yeah, exactly. So if we're all on the same board, let's go ahead and jump into the passage. So A, describe one way that creolization of African-based religious beliefs is an example of religious syncretism. So let's just deal with A for a moment. How is creolization of African-based religious beliefs that came from, you know, the Yoruba and of other areas, how is that an example of religious syncretism? Yes, they merge in a dynamic process. So it's constantly ongoing, it's changing. It's not like somebody sat down with a rule book and said, we're choosing this belief, this belief, and this belief from our African backgrounds, this one from Native American, we're choosing these from Christian. It is a dynamic ongoing. It's two merged cultures. So the religions merge together to the point where people lose track of what came from what. It just becomes their belief system. So absolutely, those are examples of religious syncretism. Well done. And yes, it was a kind of resistance to the conquerors. It was a way to defy them, but to do it in a way that's not going to get you in trouble. So let's look at B. Describe one way that Christianity in Latin America and the Caribbean demonstrated religious syncretism. Here's a hint. We gave you a whole bunch of ways in the prior slides. So let's go ahead and give people some time to answer that. I'm going to check on the poll real quick. All right, describe one way that Christianity in Latin America and the Caribbean demonstrated religious syncretism. Well, you're going to see this in one way you could explain it in Latin America would be um, extraordinary devotion to certain Roman Catholic saints, which if you looked in Santeria or Condombe, Umbanda, they, these are actually mixtures of, Christian, of a Christian saint and an African deity. So right there, that demonstrates religious syncretism. Yes, Christianity and the Caribbean merged with African religions, Latin America. 
And you're going to find a lot of it in Catholicism, the dedication to saints. Because if you go to Protestant Christianity, you're not going to find a lot of pictures of saints. So it's not going to work there as well. Excuse me. Let's move on to the next part. So. Mm -hmm. So let's go to C, our last one. Explain one specific example of religious syncretism other than Caribbean-based examples that resulted from the Atlantic slave trade. So we're looking for an example of religious syncretism other than Caribbean-based examples. So not Caribbean-based examples. Now, this one's a little more tricky unless you've got the background for this. But if you want to see religious syncretism that occurred, um, you can go into mountain areas like Peru, Ecuador, and you're going to see devotion to um, the, the cult of Our Lady Guadalupe, Guadalupe in central Mexico. Um, you're also going to see... Let's see, an example of religious syncretism other than Caribbean-based examples. Yeah, let's go worldwide. So fantastic. Um, Islam and Hinduism, Sikhism comes together. We can go to the Mahajapit kingdom, and you probably remember a Buddhist temple with a ruler, and on his, on his um, tombstone or mausoleum, he is a half Shiva, half Vishnu, deity oh excuse me vishnu and shiva yes thank you so you're going to see that blend come together of buddhism and hinduism we're also going to go to japan we'll see shintoism or, or ancestor worship merge with confucian beliefs yes buddhism and confucianism absolutely great point so do you see how we built on this and then we've reached across to different parts of the world to make an example? This is a key skill in AP World History. So please continue to practice this. And we're about to wrap up because we have an incredible individual coming up at nine o'clock. Um, uh, Mr. Eric Beckman, he is a fantastic teacher and I wanna make sure you get there in time. So I want to encourage you to think fiveable on Twitter, YouTube, or Instagram. And thank you so much for coming out this evening. Let's make sure we answer the questions real fast. And question, are the Dutch considered a trading post empire before both the Portuguese and the Dutch fall behind the British and French because of their colonies in North America? Um, the Dutch were a trading post empire. They just would not fare as well in North America as they would in other areas. So very good question. All right, I will be putting the link in here soon, but it is 8.58. I highly encourage you to go ahead and jump over at 9 p.m. All you gotta do is log out of this and then come back in, check your mail slot, and you're going to see uh, Mr. Eric Beckman, and he's doing In the Age of Revolutions. It's going to be excellent. It'll be a great follow-up to Patrick Lassiter's background. So let me go ahead and punch out of here. And thank you so much for joining. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you for joining. Go ahead and jump over to over to Eric Beckman's right now. He's just about to start up, so let's go ahead and go over there and give him a big welcome. You're going to learn a ton about revolutions. If you're coming up on Unit 5, this will be crucial. He will give you so much insight. Uh, my students, others, go there. Check it out. You will, you will be glad you did. So thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. This is Donald DiOrto. I am saying adieu.